There's no problem too big or small, no issue too hot or cold, and no subject these gentlemen won't talk about. Let's head into the lab to see what they're working to figure out today. Everybody's got a beer? That's right. We are ready to go. Ready to go. That's on the uh, video now, too, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Orange Blossom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a local yes. beer. Sponsor, sponsored by Orange Blossom. One of these days we'll get that figured out. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. Well, let's get into it and get down to it. Welcome to Figure It Out. This is George Grumbacher. Joining me, as always, is Centauri Minor. Hello, folks. Helping us move from awareness to action today is Dr. Gerard Van Bell. Hello. And <clears throat> you may or may not know that as a small child, Gerard dreamed of becoming a NASA astronaut <laughs> and did all the training. And when it came time to launch his astronaut career, they found out that one leg was just a little bit shorter than the other, so it, it disqualified him. That's why I kept on walking in circles. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really never knew why. <laughs> So you don't realize how close I came with that, actually. I, uh, I applied uh, for seven or eight rounds between 98 and 2007. And by the last two rounds, uh, I was getting calls back to go get my medical uh, screening from uh, basically a class two FA examiner. And they were calling my bosses and talking to them and then nothing. <laughs> so well, that means I got to the stage of about about the pool of 300 before they whittled, whittled it down wow. to wow. the final 100 and then the final 10 usually each time. Wow. wow. How many to get to 300? Oh, to get to 300? That's usually a pool of about 6,000 initial applicants. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it would have been cool to at least get to the interview. The interview is where they take about 100 people and they bring them out for a week. And it's apparently a really fun, interesting interview sequence. I bet. Um, they do basically any test and all tests known to man to basically figure you out. Uh, psychological, physical, other things. You know. the, 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 my favorite one I remember hearing about is, um, you know, they, they wire you up with the EKG and everything, and they stick you in a treadmill, and you start running. You start running. And you run, 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 and you will never stop running because on the wall in front of you is a picture, same treadmill with John Glenn on it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Nice. That's, that's awesome. That's really cool. Okay, well, I, 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 I thought I would start with a, uh, a, a cute little joke, but it turns out it was closer to the truth than, than I thought. I so. Wait, through. so, and, and I'm sure you know this, what are the like final criteria to be part of the team? Like, that seems so pretty I, intense. I, I can only go on, on hearsay and best guesses. Uh, I have a few friends that actually made it through. Yeah. And I think in the end, it's basically a pool of current astronauts interview you, and they will figure out if they want to be stuck in a tin can with you for a while. Fair week. enough. <laughs> that is a good, uh, I think that's, that's a actually good. it. Hmm. Oh, I love it. But in all seriousness, you are a doctor, you are an astrophysicist, mm -hmm. so which is pretty cool. Yep. And you are currently an astronomer at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Yep. But you've worked all over the world. I have. I can't keep a steady job. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing right now. So the work that I'm doing right now is I develop and use uh, high technology telescopes. Uh, the sort of telescopes that I uh, show and describe to, to my colleagues in astronomy, and they look at that and they're like, that, 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 that can't work. So it's, uh, it's fun stuff. I, I do the real bleeding edge stuff of developing things that uh, are out there on the, the real edge of what the technology can allow right now. Okay. So the, the problem I'm trying to solve is basically take pictures of stars. Uh, so right now we have one star that is easy to take pictures of, that's the sun. So the sun, if you hold a quarter at arm's length, that's about the apparent size of the sun. And we can actually take pictures of that. You can see spots, you can see other kinds of activity on the surface there. And so I'm trying to do that for other stars. And uh, this is hard because the next nearest star is roughly a million times further away, and therefore it's about a million times smaller. Mm. And so uh, you need a very, very large telescope. And so the, uh, the problem that uh, I have as far as trying to take pictures of other stars fits under the umbrella of a bigger problem, which is how do I increase the, the so-called spatial resolution of a telescope, which is uh, mainly like the zoom lens on a telescope. How do I make it so that 
I can uh, turn up the zoom to levels that have not been possible before. Uh, the, the, the trick is your telescope has to be about the size of a football field or larger to get enough zoom. Wow. Yeah, so they're very big. Uh, in the history of astronomy, there's been this march of increasing the size of telescopes. And this march has given you two things. As you get to bigger and bigger telescopes, as you go from something that's you know, the size of a, of a beer can right here, or the size of a table, or the size of a basketball court, these are all sizes of telescopes that people can build nowadays. Um, you get two things, one of which is uh, more sensitivity. Your light bucket is bigger and bigger to catch more light. But this increasing size also gets you more zoom as the, the size gets bigger you get more ability to pick out fine detail in the sky. And uh, the game I play is how to chop up that telescope into small bits, throw away most of the bits, and with the ones that are left over, I can still take pictures of things at very high detail in the sky. Since I've thrown away most of the telescope, I can't do things that are very faint. I, I've thrown away most of my light bucket, but I can still put the lights back together in such a way that I get a very high zoom picture. Okay, so you sacrifice the light for the zoom. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to have the light as well, but I can't afford it. Um, to how much does how much does a project like this cost? So a project like this costs between five and a hundred million dollars. That is a big range. So tell me about the <laughs> what you would like to do. Is it more on the hundred million or the? Five oh, what million? I would like to do is spend a hundred million. <laughs> But uh, I've worked on projects that have uh, uh, basically spanned the whole range. Okay. Um, so I've worked on projects uh, out on the Palomar Mountain, which is nearby San Diego, next to the famous Hale Telescope, the 200-inch telescope that's uh, for about 50 years was the largest telescope in the world. And next to that was a little test bed that we used to, to try out some of these technologies uh, to basically get something a, a telescope that was about a football field in size. Mm. Um, the in, we had small little individual telescopes that were about 20 inches across. Uh, and we had three of them, and we combined them together to form something that was about the size of a football field. Mm -hmm. And that ran, that was about a $5 million project. Uh, that went into a project I did out in Hawaii called the Keck Interferometer. The two Keck telescopes were there. Uh, each one of those telescopes uh, independently uh, built with funding from primarily uh, private philanthropy ran about a hundred million dollars and then we put in the back end that let us join those two telescopes together and that was also about a hundred million dollar project okay so how long is that how long is that hundred million dollar telescope relevant like I'm sure it works forever, <laughs> but like, oh my gosh, a week later it's obsolete. Or so telescopes are funny. Telescopes are devices that are built to hold glass in a particular shape. Okay. And as long as they can serve that function, they can actually serve for a very long time. Uh, so for example, this Hale telescope that I mentioned, it was first commissioned in 1947, I believe. And it's still on the sky every night to this day uh, because it's still it's serving its purpose of holding its uh, main optical element, which in this case is not a lens but a giant mirror that's about 200 inches across. Uh, it holds that in the right shape, and so it works just fine. Um, the stuff that I do actually tends to have actually a shorter shelf life mm -hmm. you know, on the order of 10 to 20 years, uh, in part because the technology I'm helping develop is uh, so new. Uh, we do have uh, a number of facilities that had been built for just testing the technology, and now they're starting to give way to more mainline operational facilities that themselves will probably have longer uh, operational lives. Got it. So when you say it's um, the size of a football field, does mm -hmm. that mean that that's how long it is? So, so it's the light will travel that 100 yards effectively? Yep. So it's basically uh, the, the size of the fence line around the site, uh, which actually up in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, where I'm at, uh, it's actually four football fields across. So we have about 1,200 feet from tip to tip. That is all encircled by our fence where uh, we have uh, on that site, we have, right now we have uh, small telescopes, telescopes that are about five inches across, so about the size of a dinner plate. 
and we can take up to six of those at a time that are located throughout this site and gather the light and all that light gets sent to the back end. It's all done with mirrors and smoke, mostly mirrors. And uh, at the back end, we take that light and we actually weave it back together. And at that point, we can take a picture. Oh, wow. And it's the trick of how do you correctly weave it back together uh, that keeps me employed. Uh, so basically, you have to align all sorts of optical elements along a so-called beam train, so these mirrors that are reflecting light from mirror to mirror and mirror to the back end. And you need to make it so that everything is aligned to about 10 nanometers. Uh, and what that is is if you take a human hair, expect it 12. You take yeah, uh, 12 to 15. <laughs> you take a human hair, that's about 100 microns across. Uh, you divide that about a thousand times. That's 10 nanometers. Wow. And that's that's the tolerances we align everything to in real time. We actually are moving these things, and so we we actually jigger the uh, the positions around uh, at about a thousand times a second. And how is that done? Lots and lots of lasers. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we have uh, we have a lot of lasers throughout the, the the facility that basically let us gauge distances at that tolerance level at this ten nanometer spec. And those lasers, uh, if if you build a laser correctly in, in into an instrument, you can actually use it as a very special ruler. And the laser lets you measure the distance between things at this this ten nanometer level. And so. Uh, that is the element that lets us determine if everything's in the right place. And then we have a lot of elements in the system that are on motorized mounts that we basically push around. And so we get the feedback from the lasers and the motors then put things in the right place if they're out of place. Extraordinary. I'm, uh, so I'm fascinated by kind of the business of this. So yes. with projects of that size and that scope uh, being on the, the funding side, Walk me through how do you secure dollars for something that's, and I'm sure it's not at the $100 million in Flagstaff, but multi-million dollar projects. Walk me through that. So the facility up in Flagstaff, the aggregate cost probably is in, in the range of north of $50 million okay. at this point. Uh, I'm, it, it's been built in increments over time. I'm currently PIing, a, a, I'm the principal investigator for a project that's uh, funded at three and a quarter million. Uh, and we're adding bigger telescopes to the site uh, that are about 40 inches across rather than five inches across. That particular funding has come from the Naval Research Lab. Okay. Uh, and so the NRL, uh, which is a part of the Office of Naval Research, uh, is interested in this technology as well. And so uh, you can apply to them. Uh, there are also uh, other civilian sources, such as the National Science Foundation or NASA, where you can apply for money and basically pitch ideas to them. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually one of the things that I really enjoy about being at the Lowell Observatory is that uh, contrary to what the uh, notion of what many people think of you know, as the ivory tower of academia, uh, it's really entrepreneurial and it's hyper competitive to okay. secure these dollars. And so you have to have good ideas. I believe it. You have to present them well and you have to pitch them well. and. Uh, you know, you can get selected if you are successful in all those arenas. And uh, yeah, so I, I actually really enjoy that. Uh, you know, I like coming up with good ideas and being, being able to sell them and tell people about them and get people excited about them. And so in this case, uh, in the case of the Naval Research Lab, uh, the Navy has had interest in this sort of technology because it's actually quite practical. Uh, it's practical on a number of fronts. Just in, on its face, astronomy in general always has had interesting spin-off technologies, but then there's actually direct application as well. Uh, and I like to summarize that in terms of, uh, you know, when people ask, well, what, what does it mean to me, is your <laughs> phone. Your phone is directly uh, affected by my work on many fronts. So, for example, the fact that your phone has a little tiny camera in it, and you can take your selfies with it, that camera... Many that, every day. That's right. It's important to have a selfie. I'll take it right now. Um, that camera, the detector in that camera, came out of technology that was spurred on by astronomy. Astronomy pushed very hard on getting these detectors built, and the uh, so-called charged couple device, a CCD detector, uh, that really came out of a big push from astronomy. And that, uh, in the ensuing years, since the mid-'80s, when this technology first came out, uh, has now been miniaturized and shrunk down and is now on your phone. 
Um, everybody uses their phone for navigation. And navigation comes from the fact that in circling the Earth, there's this constellation of uh, GPS satellites, uh, the Global Positioning System satellites. Now, you get your idea of where you're at from GPS, but how does GPS know where it is at? And in the end, GPS knows where it is at by using the method that's been used for hundreds of years now, which is basically celestial navigation. Uh, you have to basically reference your position based on things in the sky to know where you are at. And if GPS doesn't know where it is at, then you don't know where you are at. Ah, so this, everybody's screwed. Wow. That's right. So your phone gets that information from the GPS, but the GPS needs the navigation. And telescopes like this help the Navy, which is really the principal repository of both uh, time and space for the US government. Uh, it helps the Navy do, be do a better job of locating you and other things as well. Right. Uh, they have other applications for navigation, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Uh, there are other things that come out of this as well. Uh, for me, trying to answer this, this problem of take, taking pictures of other stars, um, I think it's a very interesting endeavor. It's very uh, academically satisfying. It's also very practical in the sense that knowing about other stars tells us about our own star, namely the sun. And in particular, we want to know a number of things about our sun. For, so for example, we're very concerned about climate change here mm -hmm. on Earth. Is the sun normal? Is it going to remain normal? Is it going to remain steady in its brightness? Uh, one of the ways you can do that is by studying the sun, but you know, if you, if you were to ask a doctor if they could understand all patients in the world by studying just one patient, they would laugh at you. They, they want to, you know, the only way you build Yeah, you would, the way people learn about how uh, a group of patients would behave is you study a whole bunch of patients at once. And so we need to study other stars to enhance our knowledge of the sun. Mm. And uh, it, you know, the short answer is our sun's pretty normal and pretty boring. It isn't going to change, and so it doesn't actually affect climate Not for change. Not for a long time, anyway, right? <laughs> um, but uh, there are other things too, such as uh, uh, related to climate change is space weather. So the sun, every now and then, has little burps, little hiccups, where it actually has solar storms that throw material off. Uh, the last major one in uh, the mid-19th century uh, threw off a great deal of energy and set telegraph wires on fire here on Earth. Mm. And, uh, we have not had one since. But uh, it we're... It would probably be a mess. It would be a big fat mess. If one of those is there a possibility of that ever happening again? Uh, it certainly will happen again. Oh, wow. The question is when? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Whenever the sun gets angry. <laughs> when, when, it's right. when, when it right. gets pissed. Sacrifice to the sun know. gods. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, the, um, so also learning from other stars how common this is, is very important. Uh, and so this is one of the things you learn by studying more than just our sun. So well, I'm sure that the farther and the greater clarity you can see into space, that has practical application for anything. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know that I fully understand why it is that, that NASA isn't as, as prominent as it used to be, and mm. you've referred to it as a civilian yes. group. So can you explain that to me? So NASA has always been a, a civilian space agency. In fact, Didn't know that. It was set up explicitly as that, as a counterpoint to the Russian uh, space effort, the Soviet space effort, actually, in 1957, uh, to counterweight the fact that their effort was very, very militarized. Mm. Uh, and so it was explicitly set up as a civilian agency. Uh, certainly NASA has dealt a lot with the Department of Defense, the Air Force, the Navy, and so forth. Um, and there certainly is gray areas of overlap between the two, but, but NASA itself is explicitly a, a civilian agency. Oh. Yeah. Um, NASA's interesting in a cultural sense because of, you know, think of how many other federal agencies that people will pay money to have the logo of on their shirt. People love having the NASA logo on their shirt, but what else would they do that with? Um, people are very, very uh, fond and favorable towards uh, with NASA. And um, I think that uh, they perceive correctly that they've, their, their lives have gotten a great deal of value out of the investments in the space agency. Um, one thing that I think is not quite correct on the part of the public is the perception of how much money is spent in NASA. I think recent surveys by the Pew Agency indicated that people felt uh, a quarter of the federal budget was spent on NASA. Why would anyone think that? 
uh, they would think that <laughs> because <Wow>. of <laughs> the fact that the splashy things that come out of NASA, you know, pictures from Hubble yeah. and results from people being in the space station and so forth, uh, make a lot of news and people really like it. Um, in actuality, the spending is between, uh, I think it's half to a quarter percent of the federal budget uh, is spent on NASA. Uh, it peaked in the mid the mid '60s at about four percent at the height of the Apollo program when they were landing people on the moon. Um, but you know, if if uh, spending on the space agency were to come up even back to a percent of the federal budget, it would just you know, like be modern day miracles once again. So that's really fascinating because uh, one of my questions to you is, as an astrophysicist, talk me through your thoughts on the importance of STEM today. So uh, if you're now in school at any level, the, the, the rhetoric is STEM is important, this is why. But tell me from your standpoint. So I think STEM is very important uh, in that it is the pipeline that feeds so much of the industrial engine mm -hmm. of the US. Uh, many of the jobs that are currently to be had in the US uh, are related to uh, not necessarily manufacturing, but more design and other things that are directly connected to having a, a wide store of intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the STEM activities of our schools help, help fund that. Um, we hear about that a lot in astrophysics because it really is a lightning rod for STEM and for people uh, uh, grabbing people's interest about STEM. Uh, and so it's we get sexier things. It is, if anything, sexy about STEM. But yes, it is. You know, uh, we get a lot of requests up at Lowell for uh, speakers for schools and this kind of thing. And you know, it's always uh, a lot of fun to go talk to school kids about you know doing space things and working on telescopes and so forth. Um, I uh, I work with undergraduates from the Northern Arizona University, and uh, it always is a good training ground to bring them up to the next level as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's fun doing that in the sense that um, astronomy allows you and challenges you to be a jack of all trades okay. when it comes to learning about engineering, programming, design, uh, all kinds of arenas when it comes to making things work. And uh, I like that then that it's not very compartmentalized. Uh, you have to be very uh, interdisciplinary in how you make these things work. Uh, and I think that uh, that speaks a lot to uh, one of the purposes of STEM is to get people conversant with uh, many arenas inside the sciences. Yeah, that's awesome. Near Earth objects. I listened to a recent podcast and said that with advances in our ability to see into space, there are a lot more than we had initially thought. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true or not. Are these near Earth objects going to destroy us? Wow. An aggressive question. <laughs> uh, it, it is a problem if we ignore it, they will come and hit us sooner or later. Um, now, the answer there should be expanded on in the sense that that will happen to us over geologic time scales. So I'm talking thousands of years before we get whacked. Uh, you know, the last real major impact was thought of as the, uh, the KT event that, that wiped out most of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago. Um, but you know, there's probably been lesser events, and we have evidence of actually one in a very dramatic way up by Flagstaff uh, with Meteor Crater, uh, Beringer Crater, which is uh, just a couple miles outside town. It's a mile wide hole in the ground that was dug there about 50,000 years ago by something about the size of a house that hit us at about you know 20,000 miles an hour, and um, it did not cause another extinction event. It wasn't quite big enough, though. I think the one that wiped out the dinosaurs was. A few miles across, uh, but I'm sure that this uh, this one that hit us up in the uh, Flagstaff area uh, changed the weather for a number of years by kicking up so much dust and probably caused a, a, a nuclear winter-like effect. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that up at Lowell, there's a lot of work being done on that. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Nick Moskovitz, is doing a lot of work on this. Um, there's this gap in our knowledge of the asteroids out there. So the, 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 in our own solar system, uh, there are the large bodies, such as the planets, and smaller bodies uh, that we call asteroids. And the bigger asteroids mostly are known about, things that are 
10 miles across or more. We, we've pretty much exhausted the inventory on that in terms of finding them all. Uh, and we've even found most of them down to about a kilometer in size, which would be really problematic. But between a kilometer and about 100 meters in size, so between about a mile in size and about the size of a football field, uh, there still are pretty big gaps in our knowledge. Mm. And you know, we talk about those and call those the city killers in the sense that um, if we don't see one of those, yeah, and it comes <laughs> in, it's gonna, it will, it will flatten us. And those hit about every 100 years. Uh, so in 1908, there was one that hit in Siberia uh, called the Tunguska event. Mm -hmm. And the uh, impact of that was heard as far away as London. And it flattened the forest it hit for uh, many tens of miles around it. Um, there was uh, this other event that happened in, I think it was 2013, uh, also over Russia. Russia seems to be a, a favorite it's target. Sorry, avoid there, gotcha. That's right. Uh, the Chelyabinsk event, where uh, basically all the windows got blown out of the city of Chelyabinsk when a thing about the size of a, of a pickup truck hit at that point. And uh, so that's even smaller. That's very small. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I remember seeing video of that. Oh, yeah. There's all that dash cam video that yes. was out there. So, this is, uh, little aside, how accurate is the movie Armageddon? Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite movie, but I'm we, assuming it's pretty, like, not scientifically accurate. So we love showing that for, uh, <laughs> for science classes. You, I love that movie so much. By, uh, because it is so wildly, <laughs> incredibly <laughs> inaccurate. Uh, it actually is very illustrative in being able to show that film and show all the problems with it. So uh, give me some, and I know that film inside and out, um, give me an idea of like what is the major thing that's wrong with the movie? Well, I don't know. For example, when a spacecraft is flying over something and you, you stop the rockets, it just doesn't stop. It keeps on gliding because there's oh. nothing to push against the spacecraft. Right. Right. It breaks. Motion keeps, there's no brakes. Oh, right. I see. Um, what else was there? Uh, just the the environment that they supposedly had on the surface of this comet that was going to hit Earth was, was very unrealistic. Um, yeah, there was... Uh, I feel like we can move on from that. I feel like that's enough. Kidding. Uh, Planet Nine. Read a little bit about that? Yeah, it's called Pluto. Ooh, yeah. ooh, <laughs> touched a nerve. Yeah. I am from Lowell. If, if, if I'm not correct, <laughs> Gerard was in the room when they decided, by a vote of some kind, I, I yes. believe, that they should make Pluto not a planet. And yes. I think that he voted to keep it a planet. I did. I wasn't even, wasn't even working for Lowell at the time. So, yeah, so I was one of the 400 astronomers in the convention hall in Prague wow. in 2006 when uh, this, this was being discussed and voted on. And uh, yeah, it's a, a real train wreck of a decision. Uh, it's uh, kind of interesting in how it happened and the fact that it happened at all. Uh, I don't really know of any other definition that uh, has been seen as being needed of a vote like this. So good example. Uh, I'm a stellar astronomer. I actually don't do a lot of planetary work that uh, works on planets. but. Since I happen to be a member of this uh, International Astronomical Union, I was drafted to make the decision, even though there's very few planetary astronomers in the room at the time. Mm -hmm. So what if the planetary astronomers turned around and had their own meeting and defined what a star was, which there was no official definition for, uh, and they could mess up the definition just as well as the uh, stellar astronomers were doing with the definition of planet. Um, so it, uh, it's something we have to live with now because it's hard to unring the bell, but uh, the uh, yeah, it's it, it's a sore point up at Lowell since Lowell was where Pluto was discovered. Um, I uh, I personally like a much simpler definition of planet, which is is it big enough to be a ball? It's a very simple thing. It passes the Star Trek test, which is if you fly the Enterprise up next to it, you can look out the window and say, yeah, it's a ball. It's a planet. Uh, the current definition actually has two pieces, which is. Uh, first piece is, you know, is it in hydrostatic equilibrium? So is it big enough to be a ball? And the second piece is, has it cleared its orbital zone? Mm. Which is to say, is it big enough to be a bully? You know, has it pushed everything else out of its way? I see. But the problem there is that requires 
absolute knowledge of the entire solar right. system you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have to look at this thing out your window, Starship Enterprise, and say, yeah, it's big enough to be a ball, but you have to say, oh, well, everything is out of its way for miles and miles around, which is assuming omnipotence, which is actually bad practice in science. Right. I suppose so. Yeah. So anyway, Planet Nine <coughs> in the news is something that has not been detected. Um, it is what is common, it is right now colloquially referred to as this uh, object that a fellow, uh, Mike Brown at Caltech, has predicted the existence of. And so in the outer, outer reaches of our solar system, so it's roughly 10 to 20 times further away than even Pluto is, which is very far out. Uh, Pluto itself is about 40 times further away from the sun than the Earth. And so this hypothetical planet nine is about 600 times the Earth, moon, sorry, Earth sun distance. And um, its existence has been predicted by the fact that looking at small bodies, so other asteroids mm -hmm. in the outer, reach and outer reaches of our solar system, they all seem to move clustered in a particular way, as if something else, something big, was out there that was pushing it around. Um, and this thing has not been found. They have predictions on where to look, but uh, has not been found yet. Um, this, by the way, historically this has been done before. The detection of, uh, I believe it was uh, Uranus, was something that was predicted by looking at the next closer uh, in planet, sorry, it's the detection of Neptune. They looked at the movement of Uranus, and they said, Uranus is moving kind of funny. There's some other body out there whose gravity is tugging on Uranus. And so uh, a prediction was made, and they said, go look over here, and they found Neptune. Now, the difference here is uh, when this prediction was made, they sent a set of coordinates over to the observatory in Berlin, I think it was, and Uranus was found, sorry, Neptune was found that very night. So the very first night, because the prediction was so specific. Wow. In the case of this so-called Planet Nine, uh, it's basically kind of, you know, oh, look over there somewhere <coughs> in this general direction, which is about, actually about a third of the entire sky. Oh, okay. Um, and so it hasn't been found yet. Over there somewhere. That's right, over there. Somewhere. Kind of, yeah, it's a uh, needle in a needle stack. Sounds like I ask a dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, I'm really curious about how did um, Lowell, or rather Flagstaff, be this hub of um, astrophysical innovation, like what, give me the history behind why they're... So it's very interesting how that came to be. Uh, Percival Lowell was this uh, favorite son of a very wealthy Eastern industrial family. I believe the Lowell family in the 19th century made a lot of money out of textiles. Mm. And he got interested in math and astronomy and decided to build an observatory. So he sent a person to Arizona to uh, come scout out sites. And so he basically, this uh, scout traversed the length of Arizona going from south to north, looking for good sites for an observatory. And uh, he, um, I think basically the, the real story is he, he got tired by the end of his trip and, and ended up in Flagstaff and just said, you know, I'm, I'm, here, here's I'm done. Yep. <laughs> and so that's how it got established in uh, 1894. And uh, then Principal Lowell set up shop on Mars Hill in Flagstaff. Nice. So what's interesting about Flagstaff is we have the Lowell Observatory, but we also have the U.S. Naval Observatory uh, has a station there. They also have a station in D.C., but the Flagstaff is their so-called dark sky station because the skies in Flagstaff are very dark. And there's also the USGS has a big um, uh, astrogeology section there. And then also the Northern Arizona University has a, uh, has a graduate department for astrophysics as well. So in fact, it's quite a cluster, particularly considering the size of the city only being about 80,000 yeah. people. That's fantastic. Nice. So uh, a common theme that we've been talking about um, on this podcast so far at the end of 2016 is the recent election and how it's affecting just about everything. So walk us a little bit through your very, um, very heavily uh, government funded, I'm assuming. So yes. walk me through what the election means for dollars for you. It's uncertain, as is most things with this very exciting and uh, somewhat mercurial uh, incoming administration. Yes. Uh, the president-elect, uh, his only direct remarks on NASA has been to point out how uh, it is irrelevant to Earth-based activities. 
Okay. Um, a few of his advisors actually wrote a uh, lengthy write-up in, uh, I believe it was Space News, an editorial there, claiming about how that, of course, was not true, and he will support NASA to the hilt and do very interesting things with that. Um, so it's hard to tell what's going to go on there. Uh, I think that there will be a emphasis on more commercial activities with NASA. Um, and so uh, to, to put a finer point on that, NASA has historically designed and flown its own rockets and uh, put humans into space with uh, engineering that is done in-house. Mm -hmm. There's been, there's started to be a shift away from that with the space station, uh, the delivery of cargo to the space station has been turned over to commercial services. So the money still goes to NASA, but then all NASA does is cut a check to uh, Orbital Sciences and SpaceX, and they ship up cargo. Uh, and so this is actually pretty cost effective. The, these companies uh, design the rockets themselves, and they, they take on the risk of flying these rockets, and if they don't get there, they don't get paid. Um, and so there's actually a certain logic to that, and actually I think that's, that's good. Um, but there is talk of increasing that uh, activity of NASA being more of a uh, procure, pro procure of logistics rather than doing in-house design of rockets, which it's still doing somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some deep space rockets that it's building right now, and uh, there's some questions about the economic viability of that and the expense that goes into that. Because for NASA to design and fly a rocket, uh, it appears to be actually quite a bit more expensive than for a private company to do so. So that's that's one area. <coughs> the space science funding that NASA funds, it's unclear what this administration is going to do. The similar sort of science that the National Science Foundation funds, it's unclear what the administration is going to do. Uh, there are also aspects of my work that are funded by the Department of Defense, through mm -hmm. the Navy and Air Force right. and so forth. That potentially could go up. Uh, there's a possibility that there will be increased funding on the military side um, that will come out of this administration, which is definitely not shied away from rattling sabers, which means that uh, yeah, there may be more money for the uh, for uh, science and technology through the uh, military because there's some aspects of that that are of interest there. Uh, certainly, this year the S and T budget out of the Department of Defense is going up. Uh, that's more S and T uh, science and technology. Uh, that's uh, something that is the you know last outgoing uh, write-ups of the uh, Obama administration. So I think it is a recognition of the value that people get out of uh, spending money on science and technology. But uh, yeah, I have no idea what this new administration is going to do. When you said that you expected additional commercial uses for NASA, I was expecting some kind of luxurious Trump Hotel on the moon. <laughs> well, more tourist flights to uh, the space station, maybe. You yes. Know? Yes. yes. So it's going to be gold-plated. You uh, did a really good job of showing kind of the practical implications and applications of the work that you do, but I'm sure a big hurdle that you run into in just um, everyday folks is getting them to care about what you do. So for our listeners, what, for the everyday person that's sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, why should they care about Lowell Observatory and the work that you do? So I think that, as I've mentioned before, there are certain direct tangible benefits right. of uh, the technology and, and even the, uh, the science that comes out of this. Uh, the, the other thing I always like to highlight is any society worth its weight in salt has always engaged in exploration and engaged in uh, just expanding their horizons. And usually there has been spin-offs technology-wise uh, that have come out of that, but in a greater sense, these societies have always benefited also in just an aesthetic sense of knowing humanity's place in the universe uh, and not necessarily being dwarfed by that, but actually, I think, feeling a renewed sense of awe and inspiration from learning about the cosmos. And I think that that is of paramount value from, the, uh, from science like astronomy that uh, uh, does a lot of that sort of thing. Um, one thing that probably will happen in the next 20 years or so is uh, the field of astronomy has gotten better and better at finding planets around other stars. And a major effort in astronomy right now 
uh, that is related to these high-tech telescopes I built is not only discovering these planets, but characterizing these planets, seeing if uh, they are like Earth or not. Uh, and then ultimately, the goal here is finding if there is evidence of life on those planets. Uh, I'm not talking about Little Green Men or anything like that, but finding evidence of, let's say, photosynthesis, mm -hmm. or finding evidence of chlorophyll, or this sort of thing. And I think, should we get to that point, and I think personally we will, uh, that will be a huge revolution in how humanity views itself. And uh, I think it'll give us additional perspective on our place in the cosmos. And so I think that that is one of those things that in addition to the direct tangible values of you know, how we make your phone work, um, you know, we will be able to also help answer some fairly deep philosophical questions that humans have had for thousands of years. Nice. Mm -hmm. What is the fascination, not a fascination, what's, what's with Mars? Why does everybody seem more with Mars? So that's actually an excellent segue off of my answer here, which is Mars is of interest scientifically because it's one of the more likely places that could harbor life in our own solar system. Uh, these planets I was talking about are objects that orbit other stars. Mm -hmm. But Mars is of special interest because it's a body that potentially could have life, or at least could have in the past had life. And so, you know, maybe we'll be doing Martian archaeology in a few years of looking for remnants of leftover microbial life from on, on Mars. Um, Mars holds a, a special interest for uh, exploration as well, and, and more human exploration of, of our solar system, in that it's a place we can go to and potentially have a permanent human presence on Mars. It's uh, got enough resources, it's got enough uh, access in terms of us. Resources like what? Uh, resources like its atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. You can actually turn that into, you can break it apart and pull the oxygen out. Um, you can actually turn it into methane, which is a good rocket fuel. Um, its uh, soil is something that you can use potentially to grow. I mean, a lot of the, uh, in contrast to Armageddon, <laughs> uh, I very much like the, the movie uh, The Martian, which recently came okay. out, uh, because they took some liberties here and there, they always do in Hollywood, but they, they tried very hard to uh, get it right and to uh, try and make it as realistic as possible, and by and large it was. Uh, so, for example, the whole notion of growing things in Martian soil is actually uh, probably quite right. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it's a place that uh, people think about in terms of expanding the human presence into the solar system. Um, touching back on, on uh, your question, Satari, about um, the Trump administration, uh, a big push on the Obama administration for human space exploration has been to focus on Mars and to start to build the infrastructure that will maybe take us there in, say, late 2020, early 2030 timeframe. The Trump administration is making, the incoming administration is making grumblings about keeping with that, but maybe first going to the moon. Um, and there's a certain logic there in the sense that uh, people often derisively say, well, you know, been there, done that, with, you know, in the 60s with landing people there on the moon. Right. But, you know, imagine if you were to have said, well, you know, I've seen all of California if you basically saw the inside of a hotel in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't have seen the Grand Tetons, you wouldn't have seen San Diego, you wouldn't have seen the beaches of LA, 